B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Monday, July 29th, 2019. I've got a stack of news to my left here. And tons of opinions to share with you. It's news and comment time here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast. On Friday, the Supreme Court, offering further evidence of minority rule in this country, issued an unsigned opinion allowing the Trump administration to divert $2.5 billion, chump change, from a Pentagon fund to pay for a portion of wall construction on the southern border. This is a very serious departure. They are undermining the Constitution, exercising the partisan power of the majority, which represents a minority, imposing its will, and shredding the Constitution in the process. And the court manufactured a technicality that was not in the record before it. The record that came from a trial court, then reviewed by an appeals court? None of them had any issue with the so-called standing, the legal standing, of the parties who brought the lawsuits against Trump's plan to illegally divert this money. The Sierra Club and uh, another group, including the American Civil Liberties Union, were found to not have legal standing to bring these cases. And their cases uh, reflect individuals who own property along the border, who reflect the issues related to the environment along the border. And as I said, in the lower courts, there was not a hint of an issue related to standing. But that's how the court abused its discretion in order to give Trump, as I say, a modest amount of money. Now, they claim that Trump can have the money as the legal process continues. They said that they did not weigh in on the underlying matters. But historically, In a case like this, if the court has any intention to block Trump from making this maneuver, they would have left a stay in place. And Trump has used a series of excuses. One, they shift the focus in the court cases to drug enforcement and drug interdiction at the border. And that's the purpose of the wall. And therefore, the war on some drugs takes precedence over issues like, uh, you know, private property rights, environmental laws. And of course, in February, after Congress had refused to give him the money, even after he forced a government shutdown, the longest in history. And that's on the record that the Supreme Court cannot ignore. Congress flatly refused to appropriate this money for the purpose the president intended. And by overruling that congressional budget authority, again, the Supreme Court gives precedence to the executive branch over the other two, siding with the executive and undermining the critical separation of powers, which I think... Uh, represents some of the most brilliant aspects of our Constitution. So this is a really ugly development. This will have long-term implications. Future presidents, including this guy, if he gets a second term, can declare a phony emergency can claim that because of the budget cycle, that if they don't get approval for this money before the end of the fiscal year, it just evaporates? Those are really insulting arguments for the Supreme Court to embrace. Now, the alleged liberal members of the court dissented, and Stephen Breyer said the case raises novel and important questions about the ability of private parties to enforce Congress's appropriations power. But the immediate issue, he said, was merely whether to enter a stay of the trial court's injunction. 
And Breyer said that allowing uh, construction to start would cause irreparable harm to the challengers and to the environment. But the majority that represents America's minority, they ignored those rational arguments. And I'm deeply opposed to the wall. But I can accept a legitimate loss if the system is followed. But allowing Trump to rewrite the Constitution to suit his purposes in this short-term situation is so ill-advised. And all of these Republican justices who talk about the original intent, the Constitution, they make deep legal hypocrites of themselves. And I want to take just a second here because, uh, as you may know, I took a three-week break and we traveled to Europe. We were in France and Italy and in Croatia. In France, I saw this beautiful seawall built along the Mediterranean in the city of Antibes. Been there for hundreds of years. I mean, it's not a defensive structure. It is one to preserve the geography of the French coastline. And I contrast that with the walls that I saw in Roman ruins, one on the Croatian island of Murter. Yeah, it sounds like murder. There's a T instead of a D. In the first and second century, the Romans occupied that area. They built a town that later was lost to pirates and invaders and to sea level rise. And I went snorkeling in an area of the ruins of this city, which was called, I think, Continuum. Then I went to southern Croatia, the largest city, Dubrovnik. Huge walls around this fortress. And these walls are meaningless today. Because you can fly a helicopter, a fighter jet. There are numerous ways to take down these walls. And when you look at the ancient walls of Europe that go back more than 2,000 years, you could see that their benefits were fleeting to those who ruled and who were generally overthrown or the empires imploded. And this is so archaic. I mean, it's not even anachronistic. It's just archaic. And to see the Supremes genuflect before King Donald and give him his fricking wall while shredding the Constitution and violating the separation of powers, ignoring the power that Congress has to say no to this president? It's a real dark day for the American system. And over the weekend, you know, Trump loves his, his Twitter. I would think that he would have put out 50 tweets gloating about his victory at the Supreme Court. But instead, oh, we got the dark Trump. So he began by attacking Congressman Elijah Cummings from Baltimore because Cummings had criticized the Trump administration for its treatment of children along our border. And so Trump was offended by that and got into some gladiator tweeting, deciding that he had to bring Elijah Cummings down and show him that you do not dare insult Trump or his egregious policies. So <clears throat> Trump issued these tweets where he essentially is blaming a sitting congressman for the failures of a city government. And yeah, members of Congress are usually influential people who have a role in the machine or the political apparatus in any American city. And it's fair to say that the Democrats uh, cannot brag about their their rule of the city of Baltimore. But the idea that Elijah Cummings can't speak out about evil acts on our border and the inhumane 
subhuman treatment of human beings because there are rats in Baltimore? I, I mean, <clears throat> it, it's obviously irrational on Trump's part. But it works for his mostly white Twitter base, the people who wear the red MAGA hats and show up at his mob rallies. And as if that were not enough, get this. Al Sharpton put up a tweet showing him on an escalator or maybe at an airport saying that he was on his way to Baltimore. And so Trump decided he had to unload on Al Sharpton. And he wrote, I've known Al for 25 years. He went to fights. I went to fights with him and Don King. Always got along well. He loved Trump. He would ask me for favors often. Al is a con man, a troublemaker, always looking for a score, just doing his thing. Must have intimidated Comcast NBC. Hates whites and cops! Exclamation point. Now, it turns out that Sharpton was on his way to Baltimore, but not because Trump had been shit-tweeting Elijah Cummings. He was attending a conference that had been scheduled more than a month ago. And I can separate the obvious racism that Trump is exhibiting here from my own feelings about Al Sharpton. I've met him. I've talked with him. I've done radio remote broadcasts from, oh, like the Democratic Convention in uh, Denver in 2008. He was two seats away from me. And I consider Al Sharpton to be an odious opportunist. I don't have a lot of respect for him. But I will come to his defense in this moment because this is an insidious, undeserved attack by a racist president. And he doubles down by calling the people he is attacking who are African-American racists. And it shows how obsessed he is, how out of control he is, and that there's nobody between him and his Twitter phone. Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, who occasionally exhibits some independence, he got on board the Send Her Back train last week at that right-wing uh, Turning Points USA summit where Trump stood in front of the faked presidential seal. <laughs> well, Rand Paul used the opportunity to attack Congresswoman Ilan Omar. And he created his own alternative facts, because Ilan Omar has never said that she is ungrateful to be an American, but that's how Rand Paul characterized her. He said, I've met people who've come here from behind the Iron Curtain. They're some of the best Americans we have because they really appreciate how great our country is. And then I hear Representative Omar say, America is a terrible place. What she's actually said is she wants to make it better. I don't believe I've ever heard her say that America is terrible. His quote continued, she came here, we fed her, we clothed her, she got welfare. I, I'm not sure she did, but he's accusing her of that. She got schooling, she got health care. <laughs> and then lo and behold, she has the honor of actually winning a seat in Congress, and she says we're a terrible country. I think that's as ungrateful as you can get. I'm willing to contribute to buy her a ticket to go visit Somalia. Now, that's the nation she left as a refugee as a child. And the insensitivity of this comment is so remarkable, but it doesn't stop him. I think she can look and maybe learn a little bit about the disaster that is Somalia, that has no capitalism, has no God-given rights guaranteed in a constitution, and has about seven different tribes that have been fighting each other for the last 40 years. And then maybe after she's visited Somalia for a while, she might come back and appreciate America more. Where will this, this descent into ugly chatter, tinged with racism, classism, and judgment, and this idea that if you criticize policies of the Trump administration, you are not American, you are other especially if you're not white. It's really troubling. 
I have to say, in, in some respects, words fail me to describe my own inner angst at experiencing this. So Trump also got on Twitter and fired Dan Coats over the weekend, and I don't think too many tears will be shed for the former senator from Indiana who presided as director of national intelligence in a wobbly way, always afraid to poke the bear, but occasionally trying to stand up for what he believed. So Trump has picked a guy who has no experience in the intelligence sector. He's a congressman, Republican, a loyalist to Trump from Texas named John Ratcliffe. And apparently he sealed the deal in some of the questioning that he laid on St. Bob Mueller last week. Here's a quote. Americans need to know this as they listen to the Democrats and socialists on the other side of the aisle as they do dramatic readings from this report. He said a special counsel, if a, if a special counsel doesn't bring charges, he should not presume to say a target was not cleared. And there is a legitimate issue here. But, of course, in his uh, salvo here, where he links Democrats and socialists without distinction, he betrays his own partisan bias. So this is a guy who was a U.S. attorney in Texas for one year. He was the mayor of a town of, uh, called Heath. I believe there's 600 people there. Maybe it's 6,000. <laughs> uh, and uh, he has no experience that is relevant. He is a strong supporter of the Second Amendment and border security. So it remains to be seen how his confirmation hearings will go. The spooks are uncomfortable. They told The Guardian in London that uh, this appointment is an attempt to neutralize U.S. spy agencies as an independent and objective voice on global affairs. And, uh, oh, you don't need to hear that. It was 6,000. He's the mayor of Heath for uh, six or eight years uh, <laughs> before he got elected to Congress in 2015. And over at The Intercept, James Risen has a new piece out, which is uh, valuable in some respects. He's kind of gotten over his uh, Russiagate bender, not entirely, as I'll point out. But his analysis here is that Mike Pompeo, who was CIA director for a year before being moved over to Secretary of State when Rex Tillerson went back to Texas, spend more time with his oil derricks, um, that Pompeo is really the director of national intelligence. And with this guy Ratcliffe, uh, who has no leverage, if he gets uh, appointed as DNI, it appears that uh, Mike Pompeo will be running the show. And Risen writes, Pompeo has emerged as the administration's de facto intelligence czar. Although some officials say that both Gina Haspel, CIA director, and Dan Coats have been present when Trump receives his briefings, Pompeo has gained Trump's trust in a way that they haven't. And Haspel, because she was uh, almost uh, blocked in her confirmation hearings because of her history running torture, uh, actual torture episodes for the CIA, uh, her lack of bipartisan support has put her deeply in Trump's debt. And th that's showing uh, in the way she is running the agency and kissing Trump's ass. So uh, good points in here, but uh, Jimmy Risen can't resist one swipe at Pompeo because uh, he describes the private meeting with a former intelligence official who had become an advocate for the disputed theory that the theft of the Democratic National Committee's emails during the campaign was an inside job rather than a hack by Russian intelligence. That would be our friend Bill Binney, who explained to Mr. Pompeo what he has shared with the rest of us. And this, of course, leads to the renewed interest in the murder case of Seth Rich two years ago this month in Washington, D.C. And I want to highly recommend to you, I put up a link to the video of the Consortium News live broadcast from this past Friday, where Joe Laria and Elizabeth Voss interviewed Ed Batowski, 
Now, it's a very complicated story. Batowski is suing media and other organizations who smeared him because he went public with comments suggesting that Seth Rich was the guy who leaked, not hacked, leaked DNC documents to WikiLeaks. And uh, when you watch the interview, I think Batowski comes off as pretty credible. He's a little garrulous, talks too much. But he was eager to share the full story. And I think Joe Laria did a great job interviewing him, not buying everything he was selling, challenging some of the key points. And I also want to note that a legal blog from Florida called the Florida Squeeze has excellent coverage of the new developments, this Batowski lawsuit that uh, reveals new threads in the investigation of Seth Rich and could turn the tables on the whole narrative that Russia hacked the DNC. And I want to thank Jerry Frescia, who uh, lives in Italy. He's the one who hosted us on our recent uh, vacation stop at Lake Como. And uh, Jerry sent me a link to uh, the Florida Squeeze with the comment, I bet you've already seen this. Never bet that, friends. If you see an article that you think would advance my coverage, please email it to me. I don't care if you're the 19th person to do it. I got plenty of room in my inbox, but I don't want to miss stories like this. So uh, I encourage you to read the blog post at Florida Squeeze. He lists, uh, he or she lists 13 elements of Batowski's lawsuit. Batowski first heard that Seth Rich leaked the DNC emails to WikiLeaks from a personal friend, and that would be Ellen Ratner, a woman I know. She was the sister of the late Michael Ratner, the founder of the Center for Constitutional Rights and one of the lawyers who has represented Julian Assange. Butowski claims that when he called the parents of Seth Rich at Ellen Ratner's uh, request, Joel Rich, Seth's father, said he already knew that Seth and his brother had leaked the emails. Butowski claims that the family, the Rich family, was assigned a communications expert from the DNC named Brad Bauman. And once he came into the picture, the family got really testy and said, you know, don't tread on the memory of our son. And they clammed up. And so if Joel Rich has admitted to Butowski that he knew that not only his son Seth, but also Seth's brother Aaron had helped with the email leaks. Well, this suggests a plausible scenario where the Rich family is afraid that Aaron might get hurt or killed in the manner that Seth did. Now, Batowski claims that Ellen Ratner has subsequently lied about what Julian Assange told her when she visited him at the Ecuadorian embassy right before the November 2016 election. Then we get the entry of Seymour Hirsch, who Batowski had never heard of. And because they have a mutual friend, Cy Hirsch calls Batowski, and Batowski records it without Hirsch's permission, and Hirsch is pissed about that. But Hirsch alleges that he was getting information from the former deputy FBI director Andrew McCabe and that McCabe knew that Seth Rich leaked the emails. There's also a suggestion that Seth Rich was demanding money and did WikiLeaks actually pay him to leak these emails, which would shift the motivation from one of uh, uh, political uh, sensitivity to one of just uh, a profit motive. So, as you know, I don't promote conspiracy theories. I dig into cover-ups and try to expose them. I don't know who killed Seth Rich. I think there is substantial evidence here that should be investigated about a possible role of Seth, of Seth Rich in giving the DNC emails to WikiLeaks. And we know that if this blows up, that it blows up St. Bob Mueller, it blows up the New York Times, the Washington Post, the DNC, the Clinton campaign. And most of the Democrats who've gone along with this charade the whole way. So I want you to take the time. If you watch CN, CN Live, the Batowski interview starts about an hour in, runs about an hour. It's worth it. 
I encourage you to read the blog post from Florida Squeeze. It appears to be uh, an attorney or somebody with legal training who wrote the piece. And I will continue to ask these questions. Maureen Dowd is offended that she was the focus of a Twitter attack last week from the left. She held a book party at her house for Carl Hulse, the New York Times Capitol Hill reporter. It included Nancy Pelosi, her pal from a previous interview where Pelosi attacked the squad, plus Chuck Schumer, Senator Susan Collins. And yeah, there were some snarky tweets that I saw. But this has led Maureen Dowd over the edge. She says, the politics of purism makes people stupid and nasty. The recipe for emotional satisfaction on the part of the progressive left is not a recipe for removing Trump from the White House. The argument about whether Trump is impeachable is the wrong argument. Mueller settled that. Well, it was settled before that. We know Trump did things worthy of impeachment. That's not the question we should be asking. The question is, should he be impeached? The progressive Puritans think we must honor the Constitution and go for it because it's the right thing to do. But you have to recognize that historically and politically it's not the right thing to do because it will lead to disaster. The attempt to impeach Trump is one of the rare cases in which something obviously justified is obviously stupid. An impeachment could return Trump to power. The high chair king from Fifth Avenue could exult in his victimhood and energize his always ready to be aggrieved followers. He's going to do that anyway, Maureen. How clueless can you be? And you imagine that the Democrats can beat him at the ballot box next November. And that overlooks all the voter suppression schemes, the rigged elections, and the other gamesmanship, including racist Twitter posts, that Trump will use to prevail. And I believe that... An impeachment indictment from the House of Representatives could go a long way to persuading swing voters not to support Trump in 2020. In the absence of it, will enable him to remain in power and win a second term. Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. Great folks like Carl Howard, Lyle Rubin, Jerry in Southeast Portland, and the artist Siri Walgren. I really appreciate their support, and I'd like to get yours, too. If you're not currently a subscriber, can we fix that? Visit PeterBCollins.com. Click on Become a Subscriber when you hit the Menu tab, and you'll land on the sign-up page, and it's easy to take it from there. Over the weekend, as predicted, more protests in Hong Kong. The police deployed tear gas to confront protesters and uh, swept the streets. Uh, at least 12 men have been connected have been arrested, I'm sorry, in connection with last Sunday night's attack. Uh, These are thugs who were allegedly connected to the triads, and uh, it appears that they operated with the passive acceptance of the police. So nine people were hospitalized, five in serious condition in Hong Kong, and Beijing is sending a message that while it doesn't plan to enter Hong Kong and conduct the crackdown itself, that it is uh, authorizing the leaders of Hong Kong to do that. Chinese officials made a strongly worded defense of the Hong Kong authorities, but they failed to address the demonstrators' demands for more accountability, and uh, they simply are saying that uh, should the chaos continue, it is the entire Hong Kong society that will suffer. Is that a threat of uh, collective punishment? I'm not sure, but it is a very dicey situation. And over the weekend, uh, 1,300 were arrested in Moscow, and they were protesting for uh, free or fair elections. The city council elections are coming up. Of course, it's dominated by the United Russian Party, Russia Party, controlled by Putin. And uh, there are people who were pushed off the ballot in a way that doesn't appear uh, kosher. And so it's nice to see some uh, pushback in Moscow. And I take the moment just to say that uh, I don't believe that Russia is a true democracy. And I don't believe that Putin is a wonderful and enlightened leader. And finally, today here in California, we've had two mass shootings within a 48-hour period, or at least so. Yesterday, the Gilroy Garlic Festival was winding down 
when a gunman, apparently with a semi-automatic rifle, came in, killed three people, wounded 15 others before he was killed by police. We don't have any knowledge of the shooter or his motive. In Southern California on Friday in the San Fernando Valley, 26-year-old Jerry Zaragoza, uh, according to police, allegedly shot his father, mother, and brother at their home in Canoga Park, then shot a woman that he knew, and then went on a rampage shooting strangers. Uh, He did survive and is in custody, and I haven't been able to independently verify these numbers, but... According to the Moms Who Demand guns, let's see, Action for Gun Sense in America, the Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting was the 43rd mass shooting in the United States in the month of July. And July is not even over. It is the 259th mass shooting of 2019 in the United States. Those are stunning, dark statistics. <laughs> Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. Feel free to share it far and wide. You'll find it on YouTube, and you'll find that I'm still Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling.